Hi, I'm Dan Bettinger, uh, Application Science Team Lead at Cartera, and I'm here with Andrew Bradbury, who's the Chief Scientific Officer at Specifica. Andrew, uh, thank you for speaking with me today. Thanks, my pleasure, Dan. Yeah, great. So let's share some slides. So Andrew, can you tell me a bit about Specifica's antibody discovery platform? Yes, yeah, so this is something I've always wanted to do. I was unable to do it in an academic uh, environment. Um, people weren't really interested in funding it. But uh, within the commercial environment, it's, it's a different ball game. And so what we what we tried to do was to establish a, a discovery platform, um, which was going to really provide excellent antibodies. And in doing that, what we decided to do was to start off using well-behaved clinical antibodies as scaffolds. Um, the idea being that if an antibody had been into patients then, um, and, and behaved well, then that would be a good scaffold to use for further diversity. Then within that scaffold to insert uh, diversity, which is, which is substantially liability free. So what do I mean by liabilities? Well, we, we have a lot of uh, next gen sequencing at Specifica and we're able to identify different CDRs and eliminate sequence liabilities like glycosylation sites, uh, deamidation sites, uh, isomerization and the like. Um, the result of this is uh, high quality CDRs going into high quality scaffolds, which result in a high functional diversity. So if you sequence it, we have over 90% of the antibodies are open reading frames. But because of the way the library has been designed, we also have a very high proportion of well-folded antibodies as well. And then we, we build libraries for people. So every library is, is exclusive. We use donors only once and we never use them again. The idea being that um, if you select an antibody from your, from your specific library, you can be confident that nobody else will be selecting the same antibodies. This has been a problem where the same target has been selected against the same from the same library by different, different companies. And so the, the net result of all this is that over 80% of our tested antibodies have no biophysical liabilities. So the difference between a biophysical and sequence liability is a biophysical liability is something you can measure, so it has no aggregation, no polyreactivity, and so on. Over 60% of tested antibodies have affinities better than 10 nanomolar, with 20% of them uh, sub-nanomolar. And usually when we do a selection, depending upon the target concentration we use, we get between 500 and 5,000 different clonotypes per target, where each clonotype differs from a different clonotype by uh, an average of 20 to 40 amino acids in all the CDRs. Well, wow, that's a lot of diversity. So I'm very interested in thinking that go and the thinking that goes into designing antibody screening and selection processes. So can you comment what you feel are the most important considerations for early screening and, and selection? Right, so I think um, the most important is to get a very broad uh, paratopic or sequence diversity. And the reason for that is that not all antibodies will have biological activity and you want antibodies binding to as many different epitopes as possible in order to identify those antibodies that bind to an epitope which is likely to give you biological activity of interest. So the way that people have done this traditionally is just to screen more and more antibodies, more and more clones. But even if you get up to 10,000 different different clones, or it's usually not 10,000 different clones, it's usually 10,000 clones, many of okay. which are repeated. Um, I would argue that's a low throughput approach. So what we do is we combined picking with uh, next gen sequencing, and this allows us to in the picking to identify antibodies that we have found within the next-gen sequencing. And within the next-gen sequencing, we're able to identify different epitopes, sorry, different uh, antibody sequences that are worth synthesizing using, using gene synthesis. That's very cool. So, so you're ensuring good sequence diversity before you go into the epitopic characterization and kinetic characterization. Well, that's right. what we like to do is we like to get as broad a sequence diversity as possible and then test those antibodies for binding um, and, and do things like binning uh, afterwards. Now, mm -hmm. if all you're doing is testing picked antibodies, then um, you, you, may be, you may have a lot of uh, sequence duplication, uh, 
see, such sequence duplication may correspond to completely identical antibodies, or alternatively, it might be antibodies that belong to the same clonotype. So even though they have slightly different sequences, they would be expected to have the same biological activity, albeit at different right. affinity levels. Great. Well, that's a good lead into my next question, which is, can you talk about uh, how high throughput kinetics uh, fits into your workflow? Right. So if you, measuring affinities always used to be something that was quite painful until the 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 SPR, the LSA that uh, Carter has developed came along. And so using this, we're able to easily get 96 affinities um, relatively straightforwardly, and we, we, can, in, we can increase that as well. Um, and uh, the affinities that we're getting are, are really quite remarkable from the point of view of the antibodies, as well as the data. So if you look at the data that's being shown here, you can see that the curve fits, um, which is red compared to the, the experimental, which is in blue, you can see those fits are on the whole really very good indeed. And so we're, we're we're very confident in the affinities that we're getting out using the using the LSA. Yeah, that's great. Quite a few high affinity binders as well. Um, so, can you tell us a little bit about Specifica's efforts to generate antibodies against the SARS CoV two spike protein? Right. We, being an antibody company, when when SARS started, I mean, we sort of stood on the stood on the sidelines for a bit. But after a while, it really became impossible not to to try and do something. Um, it's, it's like a moral obligation, actually. And so mm -hmm. we we got hold of uh, various forms of the spike protein. Um, we made uh, antibody libraries from patients that had extremely high titers, uh, which are illustrated in this slide. So the immune kappa and the immune lambda are two libraries that we made using uh, v kappa or v lambda with a heavy chain output from a patient had a, a very, very high titer. And uh, the plots that I'm showing there, in the x-axis, you have the amount of antibody displayed on each individual yeast. Each dot is a yeast. And in the y-axis, you have the amount of binding to the S protein. And so what you're interested in is yeast that are found in the upper right quadrant, because those yeast in the upper right quadrant are both displaying large amounts of antibody and also binding large amounts of target, which in this case is the spike protein. And what you can see that one nanomolar concentration of spike, the pattern of uh, the Gen3 uh, library, which is a completely naive library, which is the one on the top, top row, is very similar to the immune kappa and better than the immune lambda. What does this mean? This means that the, the antibodies that we're able to select using the Gen3 are essentially very similar to the antibodies that you can get from, a, from, a, from an immune library. So we believe that you can now get antibodies as good as immunization without having to immunize. Wow, that's really powerful demonstration. Um, thank you. Um, so looking at some of the kinetic uh, information you shared uh, about these antibodies, uh, I guess uh, maybe you can speak to this a little bit and are there specific uh, kinetic criteria you use in your selection before you push clones further along in the funnel? So what we tend to do is because we combine phage plus yeast display, we tend to, um, it, it all depends actually on what the, what the, what the, the, the customer wants for their antibodies. Not everybody wants high affinity antibodies. So for example, CAR T cells, you want single chains. It's not obvious that uh, that high affinity is necessarily better than low affinity. And so we always we always discuss with, with partners what their requirements are before designing a selection strategy. In the case of uh, SARS-CoV-2, we thought that, yeah, high affinity is gonna be the best because it's likely to be the most neutralizing. Um, and so what we're showing here on the left-hand side is affinities which are sorted by uh, the affinities to the trimer in orange, but also are showing superimposed, um, that's the spike primer, also showed superimposed the binding to the receptor binding domain of the spike protein. Mm -hmm. What you can see is there's actually little, not that much of a correlation between the trimer binding and the RBD binding. Um, the best affinities that we were able to identify recognizing the RBD, uh, that's the monomeric binding, that was 15 picomolar. Um, and the best, and we got a similar affinity for the best against the trimer, which is also 15 picomolar, as you can see there. Now, uh, what I was saying earlier about antibodies coming from the from from the libraries, our naive libraries, are as good as those from immune libraries, is illustrated on the right-hand panel, where in orange uh, there are some antibodies that Dennis Burton sent us. These were isolated from um, convalescent patients, 
and you can see that the 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 ISO affinity plot has uh, 10 picomolar, 100 picomolar, and so on. And you can see that all those all those orange dots um, are well within the pattern of blue dots. In fact, if anything, um, the blue dots may even be better than the than the orange dots. And so, in terms of the affinity here, we are able to get antibodies that are again confirming as good as those coming from immunization. What we have found interestingly is that, at least in the case of uh, of, of these antibodies we've pulled out, we don't show a great correlation between the affinity of an antibody for either the spike trimer or the receptor binding domain for the IC50 of the antibody. But that's a good point. I mean, epitope is is foundationally important for uh, you know potency and MOA of antibodies. So, uh, you know, can you tell us a little bit about what you learned about your antibodies by doing epitope binning or, or how this aided your characterization? Yep. So that's another nice thing about the LSA is that you can bin antibodies relatively easily. Um, so what we did here was we we tried to bin the antibodies we selected uh, against those that uh, had been previously identified by Dennis Burton. And as you can see here, uh, what we found was that most of the antibodies, well, in fact, pretty much all the antibodies we pulled out binned into what we, this bin we called bin 3B. And that included the two script antibodies uh, as, it, as, as illustrated. In addition, there was another uh, bin called 4B, uh, which was a couple of antibodies, um, which so bin 4B are two antibodies from the, from the scripts. And we were able to separate uh, the binding of those two antibodies from some of our antibodies as well. So the, the great thing about doing binning on the, on the LSA is that you can really go deep into uh, the binning and understand where antibodies are binding at the same site and where they're binding differently. Right, yeah, the, the more antibodies you include in these binning maps, uh, the higher resolution sort of the picture becomes, which I think is one, one of the neat differentiators of the LSA over sort of lower clone number inclusion binning assays, is you get yeah. this finer resolution in, in differentiation. Right. Um, oh, so this this is the sterile. This is the neutralization data I was talking about. Yes. Um, so you know, obviously, you know, congratulations. These look like very potent antibodies. Um, happy to hear anything else you'd like to to say about this data or these antibodies. But also, you know, what what are your plans for these antibodies going forward, or can you even say? <laughs> so that's, that's that's a great question. So um, the 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 antibodies. What we have here. This is data from IC50. Uh, on pseudoviral, on pseudo, pseudoviral inhibition, and again, you can see that all all the antibodies we pulled out from our naive library are in blue, and the two uh, Scripps antibodies are in red, and the IC50s we're getting here um, are, are, are all in the sub 10, 10 nanograms per ml range, um, with some being less than two, as is indicated there. And if you look to the right, uh, you look at the affinities for the RBD. You see, there's actually very little correlation, as I mentioned earlier. Um, between the affinity and the IC50. Um, we now have got live virus neutralization titers for these antibodies, and essentially they map very similarly uh, to the pseudoviral neutralization titers. Uh, we have one antibody that is down to 1.3 nanograms per ml, although um, we, have, we haven't repeated that, so uh, it could be that that will move around a bit. But these, these are really ultra potent antibodies up there with with most of the best that are out there, with perhaps the exception of some of the Regeneron antibodies. Now, what are we going to do with them? We 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 arrive late to the game, as I said. It seemed to us uh, a few weeks ago that um, these were going to be a uh, an interesting set of antibodies. Uh, we still don't know if there's any commercial interest in them, but we'd certainly we're certainly happy to think about commercializing these antibodies. We're in the process of testing uh, sequences and escape mutants. And interestingly, these antibodies, at least so far, appear to be quite resistant to escape mutants. We're trying to understand what exactly that means. And in collaboration with uh, Ian, Ian, Ian Wilson in uh, the scripts, we're looking at the structures of some of these antibodies. And a lot of the uh, pseudoviral and the live viral neutralization studies have been done with um, with a Pinter's lab in, in Rutgers and also Dennis Burton in, in the scripts. So we're open to commercializing them, um, okay. but uh, we're, we're, we're also continuing to work on them just because we think that they really demonstrate the power of this uh, naive antibody library platform.
That's great. You know, I, I'm, I'm excited to hear that people have stockpiles of potential uh, escape mutant, you know, neutralizing antibodies in the fridge in case they're needed in the future. <laughs> um, right. So uh, you can take us out by highlighting any uh, benefits or any closing comments on, you know, specific as Generation 3 antibody discovery platform. Um, you'd like well, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Dan. Well, I think ultimately, basically, what we're getting is is we're able to get drug-like antibodies directly from, from the, the libraries, the platform, without any further downstream affinity or specificity or, or other sorts of maturation. So, as I mentioned earlier, over 80% of tested antibodies have no biophysical liabilities, and the rest we found have only a single liability. Uh, over 60% of the antibodies have, have high affinities with 20% uh, sub nanomolar affinities. Very, very high antibody diversity, uh, 500 to 5,000 different clonotypes. And we found that if you do next gen sequencing, as we've done, uh, you can actually expand the epitope space that you're exploring um, by between, uh, between two and maybe 10 or 20 times, depending upon how many antibodies you're picking if you're just doing the low throughput approach. And then finally, the antibodies we pulled out of, against uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, are really antibodies that are pretty much as good as, and in most cases better than most immune antibodies. So I think that we finally managed to managed to solve the problem of how naive libraries can compete with immunization. Certainly seems that way. And then maybe maybe I should say just before we finish, um, we at Specifica we do we do antibody discovery. Um, so we're happy to do discovery if people are interested. But as I also said, we 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 also provide the whole platform um, to to partners, and this includes the aphage library, uh, very high diversity, um, the ability to move over to yeast. Um, protocols, training, the whole works, plasmids. Um, so the idea is to really set people up to be able to go out and discover antibodies they want. Great. Well, Andrew, I really want to thank you for joining me today and describing your antibody discovery platform. And, you know, we wish you great success uh, with your company's development of these antibody generation platforms uh, going forward. So thank you for your time today. We really appreciate it. Thank Thanks very much for, for taking the time to interview me. It's been my pleasure.